This is a trillion dollar industry generating billions of dollars of fees for custodians, investment banks, mutual funds, pension funds, etc. What am I talking about over here? I'm indeed talking about the largest sub-segment within the trade life cycle of equities, and that is the securities lending market, a market that is so huge across 45 countries in the world that it generates significant amount of revenues for the custodians and for the lending. It has also contributed to a large amount of volumes that have been traded in the cash segment as well as in the FNO segment of the equity markets and the bond markets. And therefore, I thought of conducting a series of videos on securities lending and collateral management. This is the first video. The first video focuses on giving an overview of what is securities lending, because many of us already are aware about the concepts of lending. Let's talk about a specific aspect about securities lending in the equity and bond markets. I'm going to handle only the topic of securities lending in the equity markets, because that's slightly different from securities lending in the bond markets. A simplistic, a very simplistic overview of this industry will tell you that securities lenders lend shares or bonds to securities borrowers. So there is a lending and a borrowing relationship. What is lent? Shares or bonds are lent, okay? And the tenure of the loan is generally for a period of 15 days or 30 days, etc. So these are short term to very short term kind of loans. The next question that comes to your mind is, are these loans unsecured or secured? Most of the time, 99% of the time, the loans are secured, okay? Both the securities lenders and the securities borrowers are participants in the markets. They're aggressive traders, they're custodians, they're holders of large quantity of assets as assets under management. These could be pooled funds like mutual funds or even pension funds or endowment plans. And the securities borrowers could be aggressive traders who work in hedge funds or in other investment banks. So therefore, since they're part of the same ecosystem, it's very normal part of the routine business for them to lend securities. But even then, because counterparty risk could tend to be high, the industry demands uh, most of the practices across different countries in the world suggest that the loans are almost always collateralized. So the securities borrowers have to give collateral to the securities lenders, okay? And the borrowers also have to pay fees to the lender. Fees is calculated as a percentage of the loan amount multiplied by the duration, multiplied by the rate of interest. So all these things are predetermined in terms of understanding the counterparties to the uh, transaction. But who decides what should be the securities that are lent? Who decides what should be the collateral that is given? What is the percentage of fees that are charged, et cetera? All this is governed by a master agreement signed by the STO, that is a securities trading organization, with different counterparties, okay? Since most of the steps in the securities lending industry is almost automated, agreements govern the clauses, the agreements put in place severe clauses, restrictions, terms and conditions, et cetera, that decide the framework within which the loan can be given. Okay, and uh, given the fact that this is a highly volatile collateral, because many a times the collateral that is given is also securities, uh, either in form of bonds or equities. In that case, what would be the governing framework is decided before entering into such a transaction by something called as a global uh, agreement. We'll be doing a separate video on agreements because in securities lending industry, the most important aspect of the loan transaction itself are the different types of agreements. So my next video, the video, the second video is going to be on the agreements part of uh, the securities lending process. Why should there be securities lending and borrowing? In any market in the world, you look at New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, London Stock Exchange, Tokyo Stock Exchange, these are trillion dollar markets turnover, okay? And uh, because of the large volume, there are many traders who take short positions in the market. There are many uh, activist uh, shareholders who want to gain voting rights for a short period of time, etc. So securities lending and borrowing came out starting from the need to trade more by hedge funds and other aggressive traders. So the lenders are 
you know, pooled investments like endowment funds, pension funds, mutual funds, who have a large amount of assets, okay? These assets could be either in the form of equities or in the form of fixed income. And any which ways they are earning returns to the holder of the asset, either by way of dividends, coupons, or price increases, etc. So then how do I maximize? How do the fund managers maximize the performance? How do they earn extra on that uh, idle securities? They do so by uh, securities lending and uh, mechanism. So the securities lending mechanism is quite profitable for the lenders because they are able to make greater use of the assets that they already earn. They already are making good use because the asset owning the asset already gives them returns in terms of price movements, in terms of returns by way of uh, dividends and bonds. Now they can earn extra. By earning extra, they're able to increase the performance of the fund. And by increasing the performance of the fund, they're able to get higher assets under management. So lenders are very keen to do this kind of business. What about the borrowers? The borrowers are interested in covering the short positions. Okay, traders who have initiated short positions. The next slide will be discussing what is a short position. Arbitragers, traders who are arbitraging or taking advantage of differences in share prices in two different markets. Sometimes there are activist shareholders who want to gain voting rights for a short period of time. And so they wait for the record date to be announced for an uh, AGM or an EGM. And then they borrow the shares just for the duration of the AGM. And then they pay it back. Many a times, large investment banks have a role as a market maker. And market makers, as you know, cannot say no to a deal that comes their way. So because of excessive selling, they could end up having short positions, but they necessarily have to deliver the securities under the short position. So now let's take a look at what is short selling. The securities trading organization can sell securities on the trading day without owning the securities, okay? So equities and bonds are perhaps the only uh, asset classes in which you can sell something without owning it. And therefore it's called as short selling. If selling short means you are not able to, you're not owning the securities on the date of the trade. But the seller's trade obligation is to deliver those securities, right? Before the settlement deadline. Stock, especially the securities are traded on a securities exchange like the NYSC or the LSEH, uh, sorry, LSEG, then uh, the seller's obligation is definitely to actually confirm the trade and deliver, and deliver the securities under the trade or else the uh, shares would get auctioned and that could result into heavy penalties. Stock exchanges have their own deadlines. Custodians have their own deadlines. Stock exchange deadlines, for example, could be validated as equal to T plus one or T plus two. The seller must deliver the securities because that's his obligation under the trade. And uh, because of that, they must deliver the securities. Even if they have sold the securities that they own, don't own, they have to deliver the securities. What can they do? They can borrow from securities lenders. If they don't deliver the securities, it will be classified as an FTD. That's a failed to deliver trade. And custodians like, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, Depositories charge very high uh, penalties and punitive fees uh, for failed to deliver trades. So in order to avoid those penalties and punitive action by stock exchanges or by depositories on the STOs, STOs who have short sold the securities will borrow those securities from other uh, lenders, from other pooled funds, like an endowment fund or a mutual fund or a insurance company. The main participants in this market are the lenders who could be institutional investors who have pooled funds like asset management companies, mutual funds, pension funds, endowment funds, et cetera, or even insurance companies. The borrowers are different types of traders, especially hedge fund managers, hedge fund traders, speculators, arbitragers, institutional traders who have aggressively short selling. You've seen in the last few weeks in the year 2022 that the markets have been you know, generally on a decline. And because the markets are in a declining phase, many traders want, want to short sell. So they can sell on a particular date and if they expect the prices to go lower, they buy back. But when they buy back, the settlement of each of them from the exchange point of view is considered as two separate settlements. And the STO must deliver the securities to the exchange before the settlement deadline. 
the largest entity who makes lenders and borrowers meet, interact, transact, et cetera, are called as the lending agents. And the lending agents are the largest movers and shakers in this industry, because if they don't move and shake, the lender will not know the borrower. The borrower will not know from where to lend, because very rarely do they have published lists which is shared to the uh, general, uh, general public or on a public domain. It's normally always shared only on a private agreement basis. In fact, the agreement will state which are the securities that can be lent. So therefore, the lending agency has this information and they have to be able to conclude a transaction between the lender and the borrower. There are two main types of securities lending. The first one is principal lending and the second one is agency lending. Let's take a look at what is principal lending. Principal lending is like the slide we just saw earlier, the securities lender directly lends shares and bonds to the borrowers who in return for the securities loaned to them, pay, pay fees and give collateral for the securities. So therefore the transaction is directly between the lenders and the borrowers. This could happen in the case where custodians are very familiar with the STO or the mutual funds or the pension plan funds are very comfortable with the counterparty and they are aware of their holding positions and they want to do a trade. But most of the movers and shakers, as I said, is driven by agents. And this is called as agency lending. This is again, a slightly simplified version of the entire process. We will be doing another slide, another presentation on how complex agency lending can be. The securities lenders lend to this agent, the securities. The agent then lends the shares and bonds to the borrowers, okay? So the lenders lend the securities to the agent. So the lenders create a pool and they lend it to the agent. The agent then decides to lend that to different types of borrowers. So over here, I just put one single block as securities borrowers, but that securities borrowers could be four different blocks, securities borrower, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, P, Q, R, S, et cetera. So there could be four different kinds of borrowers and the single agent who is delivering those loans of securities, okay? So the agent is very important to create this smooth functioning of transfer of securities from the lender to the borrower. Because if the agent doesn't do that as an as a intermediary, then you know, they don't earn any fees and the borrowers will be stuck with their limited position sizes. In return, the borrowers pay the collateral and the fees to the agent. The agent collates this collateral, takes a commission on the fees and then gives a fee to the securities lender. Okay, so the agent is like a mover and a shaker, as I said, because they actually make the movement of securities to take place. The agents could normally be uh, broker dealers because brokers are aware, right? Brokers being part of the industry for so many years are aware of large institutional holdings. And because they're members of the exchange, they also know who are the traders who have shops sold, etc. So the borrower himself or itself is a large investment bank or a hedge fund, which is actually borrowing millions of dollars worth of securities. It's not a small, tiny one-off transaction. In fact, it's very important that the securities that are borrowed are also fairly liquid because you need to have asset managers who are holding the securities who would be willing to lend it to the borrowers. The securities involved, okay, I've been using the word security, security is just way too often in this presentation. So let's like a, take a look because there are two types of them that are involved. The first one is a security that is lent, which could be equities or bonds. And the second one is security that is given as collateral by the borrower to the lender. What do you think? Which value should be higher from the point of view of lender safety and lender's uh, credit risk? Obviously, the collateral value should be much higher than the securities lent. From what I understand of the best practices in the United States market, if the securities are lent worth 100, then the collateral that is taken is between 102 and 103. Okay, so the collateral value is normally higher than the value of the securities that are lent. This is in order to protect the lender from both credit risk as well as more importantly, market risk, because the securities that are given as collateral also face daily valuation uh, changes, and it could happen that the prices of the collateral fall below the value of the loan that has been given. We'll see all that in another video when you talk about collateral management in securities lending. 
Sometimes cash is also given as collateral. And the difference between cash and as collateral and securities as collateral will be discussed uh, very soon as to how collateral is given by the borrower, which could be of different types. Is this a risk-free transaction? In this world, especially in the financial world, there is nothing that is risk-free. And because nothing is risk-free, let's take a look at what are the risks that are involved. The first risk is counterparty risk. In this case, it's a credit risk. The borrower becomes insolvent. If the borrower becomes insolvent or goes bankrupt, then how will they pay for those securities? The collateral value falls below the loan value. So now you have market risk that comes into the picture because at the time of taking the loan, the securities value was high, uh, was let's say 102, and the, collect, the loan amount was 100. But because the markets have been in a declining phase, the collateral value has fallen and the loan amount still is outstanding. Then what does the lender do? And the third risk is, what is the steps that are followed, operational risk? Securities lent are delivered before the cash collateral is received. So for the STO participating as a lender in the securities lending market, they face credit risk, market risk, as well as operational risk. So normally cash collateral has to come in first before which securities can be lent out. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you like the content, do hit the subscribe button and please share it with, my, with your colleagues and friends because it's very important to understand the basics of the securities lending industry before taking up a job with one of the large uh, outsourcing entities. Thank you very much and take care.